And yes, we're in the final month of the first half of the year, still updating you on happenings around the world with regards to coronavirus. The pandemic is still spreading, um, at least now at a slower pace. And fortunately for Africa, our numbers are still pretty low. But then again, we're still grappling with the pandemic and looking forward to completely easing restrictions when the time is right. But yesterday, the president addressed us the 10th time officially where he eased some restrictions as well. And so we'll break it down for you later, especially um, concerning religious activities in the country. And we'll be speaking to some religious heads to find out how ready they are for these new directives and, you know, how it's going to be. I mean, so basically, what's the mechanics for that? But again, my name is Berla Mundi and this is COVID-19 360. And we hope you've joined us on social media tv3 ghana with all your thoughts and your questions because we'll be speaking to our doctors later on and also find us on dstv channel 279 unfortunately anita is a bit under the weather so i'll be doing all the work today but we wish her speedy recovery now quickly let's take a look at the news headlines for covid19 around the world welcome to covid19 360 news around the globe in three minutes more than 6.15 million cases of coronavirus have been confirmed around the world according to the data from John Hopkins University. Nearly 372,000 people have died. Almost one third of these deaths have been recorded in the United States. At least 2.64 million have recovered globally. But that is not stopping the world from attempting a return to normal. Like Ghana, countries across the globe are easing slowly to normalcy. Metro Manila, Philippines' capital home of 12 million people, have been in lockdown since mid-March, but starting today, more people will be allowed to work and shops will reopen. But restaurants will not be dining in and bars, cinemas and other spaces will still close. Residents of Moscow will be allowed to go out for a walk for the first time in more than two months beginning today. The United Kingdom is also preparing to relax its lockdown despite concerns among the government's scientific advisory body. Eating out back on menu in Turkey as lockdown is eased further, restaurants, cafes, museums, beaches and swimming pools are due to reopen. More than 4,500 people have died from the virus, but authorities say the outbreak is now under control. Hong Kong announces first locally transmitted cases in two weeks. The new cases bring the total number of cases in the territory to 1,085 with four deaths. Brazil reported 480 deaths from coronavirus on Sunday, bringing its death toll to 29,314. More than half a million people in the country have now been confirmed to have COVID-19. Stadium seats 10,000 soccer fans all on Zoom. With no fans in the stadium, AGF Ahos and Randers played in front of a digital audience when Denmark's top flight Superliga resumed on Thursday following a gap of more than two weeks. And that's all for COVID-19 360 news around the globe. And we'll be coming your way every day with some updates on what's happening around the world with regards to coronavirus. Now, um, yesterday when the president spoke, uh, there was one expectation out of the many, and it was for the fact that we were hoping he would ease restrictions with regards to religious activities. And he did touch on that. And so uh, he says that an abridged format for religious activities can commence where 25% attendance in churches will be allowed with a maximum number of congregants who can worship at a time um, being, of course, 100. Now, uh, there's a mandatory rule for social distancing between the congregants as well. And this has got many people talking, asking questions. Are the churches ready? How are we going to manage this? Now, the uh, Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council, for instance, has indicated uh, that it was not expecting a spontaneous easing of the COVID-19 restrictions in the country. Now, according to the council, such a move should be done in a gradual process. And given reasons for this view, the General Secretary of the Council, Reverend Emmanuel Bariga, said that their call for a gradual easing of the restrictions will give them 
ample time to prepare their congregants on how to embrace the new normal? And that's the question many people have been asking. How do we go about it? Who decides who the first hundred congregants will be? And how many services will there be in a day? Today we're joined by Prophet Gilbert Osei Sherman. He is the founder of Yakal House and he joins us via Zoom. Good morning, Reverend. Good morning, Bella. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. And of course, I do thank understand you that you me. also run a church. And so it's necessary that we have this conversation with you. First of all, I mean, there were calls for the easing of restrictions, but were you expecting it to happen so soon, bearing in mind that these restrictions will start officially on Friday, 5th of June? Okay, thank you, and um, thank you to all your viewers. Um, it was expected, um, since if you have been following the address of the president since the beginning of this pandemic, mm. he's been systematic in how he's handling the thing. So we expected that this time it was going to be the time for the church, but also definitely we didn't expect it to be, everybody should, things should just return to normal. Yeah. So his address was, I don't think anybody would be surprised by All right. how he asked us to ease into but if we're Normally. looking, okay, but if we're looking at Friday the 5th, beginning the um, easing of restrictions, has the church been given enough time to plan? Because first of all, we're being told that it only requires a 25% attendance. And so that's about 100 congregants in a church uh, per service. You know, is it too sudden? And is there already a plan, especially for you and your church? Okay, so... First of all, as Christians, we are guided by the word of God. Mm -hmm. um, the Bible says that the scriptures are profitable for our teaching, doctrine, instruction, corrections. In everything we do, it has to be biblical. And if you read First Peter chapter 2, verse 13, the Bible says you should submit yourself to every ordinance of men for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king or people in authority, if I should paraphrase. So he's the president. Um, I said to somebody the last time, I am not in charge. My information about this situation is limited. He sits in the place of authority. I'm sure he has all the information he needs to have. He also has um, council of advisors. Um, and I saw several times there were meetings between the clergy and all people in religious position. So yeah. I'm sure before he comes up with any form of um, information, I'm sure the leadership, like you are saying, the Pentecostal Council and stuff, I'm sure they had a proud notice of these things. So for us as a church, we we pray and then we, we would be led to do what we have to do, mm. put it in context what the president has said, because we have to be law-abiding citizens. And yeah. I don't think this thing is against uh, what we stand for as a church, it's just, it, 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 like he said, it, we are not in normal times. Mm -hmm. So we, we would find a way. It's just the announcement for me, I received it last night, like you did, I'm sure, mm -hmm. around 10 p.m. So um, Does it mean church, that the, the, the various churches were not informed ahead of time? Looking at the amount of work that might go into determining who attends church first, how many services there will be, how do you ensure social distancing and all of that? I mean, some structural changes would have to happen. So where church is not Definitely. informed, maybe ahead of time? Um, for where I am sitting, I, 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 like I said, I only had the instruction Yesterday. right last night. Mm. But I'm sure that um, the people, the clergy in authority, since they have had a lot of communication with the president, since this issue happened, I've seen the president have at least not not less than twice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, meeting with the clergy. Yeah. So I'm sure some form of I even saw um, a certain um, post that was being sent to certain pastoral platforms where we were told in case we are allowed to go back to church, these are the things we should be doing. And I had some senior pastors called me and told me, have I seen the process? So some of the things he said, the church already is prepared for this. Okay. Even though you can't be fully prepared for these situations, but yeah. I don't think it's a surprise. So, so I, in your I, I church? I don't think anybody... Mm -hmm. Yeah, in your church, what is the plan? How are we going to uh, abide by these directives? Do you already have a plan as to how to determine who the first hundred would be, the second hundred, how many services? 
and all of that? So, with respect to um, the social distancing, masking, and washing of hands, and all that, for that is general and definitely everybody. It's not even only church. Everywhere we go, mm. it's it's a lifestyle now. It's it's something we've come to live it for them now. So, with that one, yeah, things are in place. But with uh, with the issue of the numbers and how service are going to be run mm. because it came in just last night. Uh, thank God we have from now till Friday. Um, Sunday. Well, till Sunday, uh, yes. Yeah, Sunday. Mm. So by then, prayerfully, I know God will guide us to what we should do and how we should go about it. Okay, but at least do you have an idea, especially because now churches are also being asked to keep a database, um, you know, of the attendees and all of that. And so we want to find out if you are aware of that. Do you already have that database or will you be updating it, um, you know, daily? Yeah, I believe every church has a database, definitely mm. every church. And with these social media platforms, every church has other mm. platforms where we communicate with our congregants. So uh, definitely, like I said, it just happened. It's 10 a.m. Um, yeah. Plans are on the way. We are praying about it. We are knowing what steps to take because we are dealing with people. So, And everybody is important. In the house of God, we are all the same. So how we can do this well and everybody will benefit spiritually mm. is what we are going to do so we'll take it from there there was a tweet about uh it's a bit spiritual i mean even though it was meant probably for comic relief i mean it was still a very deep uh, question about what happens when the spirit takes over in the churches we're being told to adhere to the social distancing directives but when the spirit takes over a person's body we all i mean for people who have attended church uh, many times have seen um you know how how it manifests so in such cases how do you intend to manage it we are not in normal times uh-huh <laughs> so i'm sure if we are not in normal times that's really to understand we are not in normal times. definitely <laughs> yes okay but the scripture says that the the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet so um, the fact that the spirit takes over doesn't mean the church is the place of this order in the house of God, there's order even under the spirit. Mm. There's, there, there's nothing called the spirit has taken over. So um, we, we, we don't know. So we should go and put our hand in the electricity to be shocked. No, the spirit takes over, but we are not in normal times. So I trust that we will control our spirit and do what okay. the president has asked. So because if, if, if the congregants are no more, if somebody... Dies because of this coronavirus. We don't have a congregation, so the lives of people are important. Mm. Um, without without the members, I'm not a shepherd. Yeah, I, I'm a shepherd because of lives, not dead lives. So um, they stay in our life is very important. Yeah. So even under the prophetic ministration, whatever it is, I believe that every pastor cares about their congregation. If you understand the work of a pastor. Um, it, Sometimes it's unfortunate how pastoral ministry is painted out there. But mm. the pastoral life, it involves so many things. People can come to your house 2 a.m. because they have issues. And we are always at people's call because we care about them. So if we care about every aspect of the congregant's life. I believe that in this same situation we find ourselves, which is not peculiar to only Ghana or Christian in Ghana. Mm. It's a worldwide pandemic. So I, I believe that because the congregants, their welfare is important to us. Yeah. We will do things that will help everybody. All right. But let's take it back to when, you know, the, the ban started on public gatherings. Mm. I mean, I'm mm. sure that it had an effect on your church. I don't know how severe it was. But how difficult was it, was it during that time in terms of, you know, getting the chance to meet with your congregants and still going ahead with church service online and all of that. Did they pose any challenges at all? Definitely. Um, everybody, the whole world, economies. I'm a, I'm, mm. a, I'm a, a football fan. Um, I've not watched Premiership. I can't believe it. I've not watched <laughs> so yeah. It has, it has affected everything, not only just uh, religion. So yeah. as a church, there, there's something with, even in our culture as Ghanaians, we are um we, we love association we love socialization christianity 
is with socialization. When the church was first established in Acts of the Apostles, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 46, from 42 down, the Bible says they met together, they broke bread, they prayed together, they shared fellowship. So if that is Christianity. Christianity cannot be done without that socialization. So mm. it has affected everybody. It affected us also. But you, you, you prepare people for situations like you go to school you go to school to prepare yourself for the future so the church is not only for now the church is to prepare you for life mm. so some of these things um, we are prepared for how you 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 know if you've been to um as you if you got saved properly you understand that waking up to do your quiet time praying on your own yeah. reading the bible these are things that build you up in a time where your pastor is not there so some mm. of these things have already been established. The people understand how you should stand on your own and pray for yourself, read the Bible as you have been taught. You go back to the tapes that we preached. I, I, I in our services, I preach. You, you've been to church before, yeah. not less than an hour, thirty minutes. Mm -hmm. So you have all this preaching. You can play, play them back and revive yourself. The word of God is always fresh. Mm. So yes, we've been affected, but hey, lives are more important. Yeah. Without their lives, there is no church. Absolutely. I can't be a pastor over MPC. I'm a pastor over people. I shepherd over people. So it's a situation we're all in it. The president, um, fortunately, is leading us, and we trust this word. We trust that, like I said, I can't sit in my house and think I know it all. Yeah. He may have information I don't have. So, okay. And the Bible also uh, instructs me to listen to authority. So I listen to what he brings up and we all follow. Okay. So we are all hoping. We are praying. We've given chance for the church to pray. He's called the fathers of the land. They've come. They've prayed. Uh, Muslims are praying. Everybody's praying and we are all hoping for the best. I don't think anybody enjoys being in this situation. Never. All right. It doesn't even help the economy. So uh, whatever is happening, it's affected everybody. Mm. There's nobody who says he's not been affected okay. by this situation. All right. But... Thank you so much, Prophet Gilbert Ose Sherman. He is the founder of uh, Yakal House. Thank you for speaking to us. And uh, for the rest of the week, we'll try and still have conversations about, around religious activities to find out whether they've been able to come up with a plan on how to go about the president's directive. So let's move on now and take a look at the case count for Ghana at the moment. And as of yesterday, when the president addressed us, uh, he gave us a figure. And now, currently, we stand at 8,070 confirmed cases. Um, okay, so 8,070 confirmed cases with 36 deaths so far. And we're updated on the 36th death being um, an aged man who had underlying health conditions, including hypertension, and also talked about not being able to breathe. Now, also, uh, we do understand that we have a greater number of people that have recovered as well. But again, let's take a look at some of the addresses that the president gave, and then we'll break it down for you. So 100 worshippers allowed for religious gatherings, and also one hour per religious service. We also have 30 maximum students for JHS3 classes. Um, yes, he talked about education as well, and 25 maximum students for SHS three classes as well, and 100 people permitted to attend private burials, conferences, weddings, and political activities. Now, yes, now let's break it down. So 8,070 cases plus 2,947 recoveries and 36 deaths. So at the moment, we currently have 5,087 active cases in the country out of a total of 218,425 tests. Now, let, let's break it down. So routine surveillance, we've done about 63.52%. Uh, and also contact tracing is 152,600. And 10. Mandatory quarantine for Accra and Tamale. Uh, we've done a total of 2,022 tests out of uh, about 1,031 uh, people that were put under mandatory quarantine. And of course, for the Kuwait, uh, people who were returned from Kuwait, uh, well, what we were made to understand was deportation. Uh, 233, uh, 31 of them um, came down from Kuwait. And out of the number, we're understanding that a number of them tested positive 
as well. So the positivity rate now stands at 3.69% with general surveillance um, at 3,081, enhanced contact tracing 4,839, and quarantine cases Accra, Tamale, uh, 115, and quarantine cases for Kuwait, 35 people um, have tested positive. And so when we come back, we'll give you more updates. We'll also speak to our doctors and find out more about the disease. Keep watching. It's COVID-19 360. All right, you're welcome back. It's the COVID-19 360. And just to break it down a bit further on some of the remarks the president made. Now, here are some reasons why we believe that he eased the restrictions. And these are based on comments he made. Now, one of them is our ability to test, trace, and treat persons with the virus, which has improved considerably. The next one is we now have a large army of efficient uh, cont contact tracers. We have expanded the number of testing facilities from 2 to 10 across the country and we have increased appreciably the number of quarantine, isolation and treatment centers. We've lessened our dependence on foreign imports and scaled up significantly domestic production and distribution of PPEs to our health workers. Another one says our hospitali hospitalization and death rates have been persistently very low, some of the lowest in Africa and in the world. We cannot live with these restrictions forever, and that it is imperative that we find a safe way to return our lives to normality. And so, uh, well, other nations have done it across the globe, and so we're trying to do so. And there has been consensus from stakeholder discussions for easing the restrictions. Our doctors are um, up on Skype and so we'll be speaking to them. So let me just break it down a little further before we speak to them as they'll be um, sharing their thoughts on the restrictions that the president eased. So when it comes to education, uh, remember that schools were closed officially from the 16th of March, 2020. Now they are to reopen to an extent uh, with appropriate enhanced safety protocols. So we'll start off with the final year university students who are resuming on Monday, 15th June with a class size uh, maximum half class and final year students of education and training institutions being managed by the ministries other than the education ministry they return to school on the 15th of June to complete their exit exams. Then we have final year SHS 3 students with SHS 2 gold track students also resuming on the 22nd of June and class size maximum 25 um, and final year JHS 3 students 29th of June is when they are resuming and JHS 3 classes maximum um, we have 30 students in there we've already touched on religious activities and how they intend to go about the restrictions and so Dr. Bertha Sewa IE infectious disease specialist and Dr. Newman Arthur clinical psychologist are on standby let's cross over and speak to them and happy new week and happy new month <laughs> it's good to see that you are doing well, and uh, thank you for joining us this yes. morning. And so, Dr. Bertha, from your point of view as an infectious disease specialist, these restrictions that have been eased, are those the right ways to go? Oh, yeah. It nicely started. It looks like it's a gradual um, way of things up. <laughs> okay, hold on. Dr. Newman, kindly mute yes. your sound for us, please. We're getting some feedback. Fine. Thank you very much. Dr. Beth, are you were saying? Yeah, I was saying that it seems like a very rational, gradual um, opening, both of the schools, only the final year students going back, and the churches have to do it very, very gradually as well. So it seems pretty reasonable and rational. Okay, but then looking at the level of restrictions, even though he's eased it, I mean, talking about schools still having a certain number in the classroom so that we can still adhere to social distancing, uh, is it going to control the situation in any way? Well, you see, there's some basic things we cannot run away from. Mm. Uh, we cannot change the fact that we do have an outbreak um, and that the world over it hasn't stopped yeah. and that we have community transmission. And so we expect that there will be some form of transmission. It will be up to every individual to make sure that they're doing the right things. And I don't know, was it last week that I mentioned that um, on May 2nd, one of the churches in America here was closed. They yeah. opened up mid-May. Actually, two different churches opened up. And one was in Houston, one was in Arkansas. All, both churches had to be closed again because mm -hmm. in one church in Arkansas, one pastor infected, well, passed the infection on to 25 people who then passed it on to another 31 or 39 people in the community. So from one church, 61 people got infected, four died. 
same with a church in Houston where it was the Catholic priest himself who got infected and several people who live in the house got infected. Um, the disease is not limited to non-parishioners or people who are only um, um, non-pastors. And so we just have to expect that since it's not written on anybody's forehead and uh, people who are non-infected or don't appear ill can transmit infection, there will be some community transmission. It's just how much we're willing to live with and how careful we're going to be going forward. All right. Well, that's interesting. Dr. Newman, now, especially about the final year students who are being asked to go back to school so they can write their exams. And I'm just reading a review from one of the students who said that uh, she's just adapting to the e-learning. Um, you know, she was just beginning to adapt to online lectures and tests. And now they're supposed to reverse and go back to the classroom. Is this going to have a bit of a psychological effect on how they, um, you know, um, I mean, imbibe the lectures and whatever it is that they are studying in order to prepare for the exams. You muted your sound, sorry. Just a reminder. Yeah. Gen you. Generally, generally, any kind of change for anybody is going to destabilize them a bit psychologically over that time. But if that change you know, uh, is maintained for a while, there's some adjustment because everybody has the capacity to cope and adjust. Those who don't, we say they are mentally unwell, mm. right? So generally, everybody has the capacity to adjust to changes, especially if it's, if it's a major change, then it may take a while. Even the while, they may be able to adjust depending on their coping strategies. So if their coping strategies are dysfunctional, then some problems will begin. If their coping strategy is functional, it's effective, then they come back to normal, right? Mm. So that is stress. Stress has the ability to, uh, uh, the impact of a certain external demand. You know, that demand can be, can be overwhelming. And depending on how overwhelming it is, your adjustments may be different. Mm. And also your perception about yourself in relation to the stress. So if you think that you can go through it, you have the ability to do it, then the impact of the stress is a bit, you know, it, it comes down a bit. It may still be stressful, but the ability to be able to cope with it becomes better. If your assessment and also about yourself and the stressful event is negative, then it's going to have a certain major toll on you and you can't perform, right? So it's more about people's perception about the challenge and also the perceptions about themselves and the ability to be able to cope and, 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 and uh, adjust to that, that stressor, right? So basically that is it, but I don't think this is a major dramatic change that uh, the person can't adjust because they go for vacation. So mm -hmm. let's take it that they've come, they've come to so its vacation and they've come, <laughs> school has reopened. You mm -hmm. know, I don't think that it will cause a major uh, problem such that the schools uh, can't uh, go ahead with the activities. But is this not going to have an effect on their level of focus, especially because we're going to school, but we have to make sure that we don't get too close to someone. We have to maintain social distancing at the same time. We're supposed to be washing our hands. So too many things happening all at once. I need to study and I also need to make sure I stay alive. Is that not too much for a student to take in? It is not normal. It is not normal. So that, that, that abnormal situation would create some anxiety, would create some stress, but it is their perception and response to that stressor that, that would, 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 would uh, be the problem, right? So we may have to teach them how to be able to cope and adjust to that kind of situation, mm. right? But I, I want to say that a human being has the capacity to cope and adjust. You know, we are tough. Oh. The human brain, the human, you know, the human has the capacity to do many things. Mm -hmm. For example, if, if, you know, the body even primes you, right, all the hormonal changes and all that, you know, prepares you to either fly or uh, to, to fight or, 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 or fly, you know, to, to be able to cope, to be able to run away from the challenge or to be able to stand against that challenge. The human body prepares you for that. So we shouldn't assume that people can't, people can't, people can't. You know, when yeah. they get into that environment, they may be uncomfortable a bit. They may be, what do you call it? They may have some anxieties here and there, right? But we have to keep teaching them what they can do to be able to uh, cope with that kind of situation. And with time, okay. they're going to adjust. All right. The only problem has 
you you all that change like people who don't care there are people who don't care one there are people who don't believe that it exists mm -hmm. you know so these are the people are likely to to spread the infection or not not even uh, uh, what, uh, what do you call it not even comply and that is even my issue with the opening of the churches right that is mm -hmm. my issue my issue is fact that uh, the, the measures put in place may not work my issue with the fact that there are some pastors who don't believe that this is real there are some pastors who think that this thing has all kinds of spiritual implications and the only way to deal with it is only prayer. There are some pastors who, who don't think that this this uh, disease, you know, is as dangerous as we make it look like. And they also feel that there is a particular way of dealing with it, apart from all the measures we are putting in place. There are people who think that way, right? Yeah. So the fear is that those who think that way are going to put the members at risk. And mm -hmm. those members are, will be the source of the infection in the, in the, in the, the normal community. So if everybody will pay attention, be holistic in our approach, we, we pray, we also take measures, right? If we are holistic in our approach, then we know that we are making a certain progress. Because whatever happens, we need to be able to open the churches. Yeah. We need to go back to normal life. But we need to be able to have the mindset that this pandemic is real. Yeah. There are actual viruses that are responsible. And if you take some physical measures, you reduce the risk of infection. In addition to the prayers, because whatever happens, we need God to be able to handle the situation. All the anxieties and stresses and the panic and all that. Mm. Prayer and meditation would help keep all that. God has a, a responsibility towards us. We also have a responsibility towards ourselves to do the right thing. Yeah. So doing the right thing now becomes the critical issue and not really the measures. Because who will count? Like who will be in the church to count who is 100? The hundreds. And if someone comes and says he wants to enter... What do you do? Do you tell the person to go back home or go and come back? You know, there are all kinds of things around that is practical in terms of people behaving well and complying with the measures. I think that would be the battle. Okay. Dr. Bertha, now to the issue yes. of churches, um, like we do understand only 100 people are allowed in a service at a time. The churches have not come up with their plan yet, but let's just say that they decide to do three, four services in a day. What measures would we advise they put in place? Because, um, for instance, you're saying that, you know, the virus stays in the atmosphere for a certain number of hours. A church service is supposed to happen for just an hour and then maybe we move on to the next, um, you know, group of congregants. How do we then control the airspace so that if a virus is left in the space, it's not transferred to the next person, just in case? Okay, so I think a few things would have to be done, um, both from a human resource perspective and also in terms of intervention. So from a human resource perspective, this could actually be a very, very positive thing for almost all infections and just general preparedness. I think that every church should appoint like a COVID-19 educator, somebody who would commit to learning a lot about the illness and even teaching people who have never listened all this well. We know that the church is one of the most powerful social structures in Africa and in Ghana in particular. It's even more powerful than the universities, the media and everything. If pastor says this, it's going to get done. So we have to make sure that every church, I know this wasn't mentioned yesterday, but I think every church should have a COVID-19 educator so that all those market women who flock to church, who were not listening to our TV, radio, everything, will have an opportunity to listen. And every sermon, should have maybe we should prefix every sermon with a little bit of education that's one mm -hmm. and then we have COVID-19 um custodian somebody who is going to make sure the church has enough hand washing sanitizers and i'm sure this has been somebody's responsibility in every church but this time it has to be a conscious effort um somebody has said that this order is not planned but if you find order in a place it means somebody has put effort into it. So over the next week or two, every church should find a COVID-19 custodian, somebody who's going to make sure that people are following the rules, the church has the plan in place and it's being followed. Um, and in addition to education, I also think that, you know, COVID-19 just came away this year, but Ghana has dealt with malaria, HIV for a long time. And these were not mainstream discussions in any church. But with this awareness, we're going to build people's capacity, if I should put it that way,
to be ready to discuss infections. Like malaria can be conquered mm. because the first eradicated in years. People can't know the name of the malaria parasite or even know its life cycle. They just know in Tuntum Kamena Mayari. I mean, by this time, we would want people to understand the illness. So I'm looking at it from a purely wow. This whole COVID-19 thing can be a big plus in terms of getting people aware of the infections that we deal with and getting coming aware of how themselves can power themselves. So those are some of the my you know interventions I think that church should put in place. We're, we're hoping that the spread will be reduced, but just in case we start recording uh, higher numbers in terms of spread. What would you advise, especially looking at countries like South Korea who have recalled 200 schools or more and they've gone back to the online um, way of studying because they were recording higher numbers? Should this be something we should consider just in case? Oh, yes. I mean, like I was telling you, two churches in, in, in America were closed and I'm yeah. sure they're just one of um, many. Um, there's, there's a saying, a proverb that he who doesn't change his mind is a fool. Um, I, I know a few countries who opened schools and then they closed all the schools again. Yeah. I mean, Spain, for example, went to their um, parliament and they've extended their lockdown till the end of December. You know, Spain had a lot of people dying, like thousands every mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. They opened back up and decided that, look, this is not going to work for us. Just a few months financial difficulty on doing what we're going to do. If it's going to save lives, then our life means something to us. I think that the president's initiative, the time he talks, so this is subject to, subject to feedback. If we start getting out of churches, it's going to, you know, okay. and it may not be en masse. Maybe it will be a particular closing because there's not. I mean, for sure, somebody with a infection is going to go into some service. I mean, that's a given. Okay. And Dr. Newman, kindly, kindly mute. Dr. Beth, are you done? Please. I just wanted Dr. Newman to mute his sound. It's giving us some feedback uh, so you can right. just finish what you're saying. Dr. Newman, yes. can you hear us? Please mute your yes, sound. Yes, I can. All right, thank you. Dr. Beth, please finish up. Yes. Yeah, so I was just saying that, I mean, it's, it's not... Um, rocket science to imagine that by all means one of the services somebody with an who is either incubating disease or asymptomatic might be present we just that's why i'm talking about a covid 19 um custodian somebody who is either either going to be and you could we could even add temperature checks although mm. scientifically it's been proven that the temperature checks picks very very little disease given the signs and symptoms we went through the other time but Measures will have to be put in place. People will have to be asked, have you had a cough, a mm. fever? The, if it's just going to be 100 people, there can be a lot of control. Have you been sick? Have you been in touch with somebody who has COVID-19? All these questions would have to be put in place to ensure that, because we don't have too many pastors. We wouldn't want any pastor, I mean, falling ill and dying. That would be very, very sad um, commentary in, in Ghana. Okay. So it, we have to put that into place. All right. Dr. Newman, now you can unmute, please, before you forget <laughs> again. But quickly, um, if I may ask, and we're moving away a bit from the conversation around the president's directives. Um, I'm seeing a headline that says that health workers face eviction threats from landlords over coronavirus fears. And this is happening at New Edubiase. And so it says that even though the health workers have not tested positive for COVID-19, some landlords in the communities think the disease can be contracted in their homes because of these healthcare workers. So because they don't want um, any form of illnesses, they are threatening to eject some of these health workers. What do you think about this? We've been talking about stigma for God knows how long, and it looks like it's still not hitting home. I, I don't think it's, it's stigma. I think it's fear and ignorance. Okay. Uh, I think it's fear. They are afraid that they're not sure what they do. They are afraid that they spread it. And we are frontliners. Because sometimes I, I'm even afraid to go to a certain environment. I don't have it, but I, 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 when you work in an environment, every day, there, you want to protect from getting it. So I, I don't. I think it's fear and 
So I think we should keep it right. And like, but they are not justified, even if it's fear. There's no justification for threatening to, uh, you know, evict you know health it, workers. So it's it's we, we can't justify that. It, it it is not. But it is because they are afraid and they are ignorant about 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 it. And so the way forward is just to educate them. I think some of the landlords have to be sat down by someone else to talk to them. So if we can identify specific landlords who have such concerns, I think that we should be able to uh, let someone uh, speak to them about it so that they, they would allay their fear. But I think, I think some of them may just be afraid. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, that's all for today. So thank you so much, Dr. Bertha Sewa Ai and Dr. Newman Arthur. It's been a pleasure and we'll see you, God willing, tomorrow. All right, thank you. All right, so, and have absolutely enjoy your day. Now, today we're crossing over to the UK not to talk to a COVID 19 patient recovered, none of that. Uh, but basically, we just want to find out from uh, a YouTuber how she reads bedtime stories to children um, in the African communities and other communities as well in the UK, and how we can adopt such practices here in Ghana, especially knowing that uh, kids may not be going to school anytime soon for the next month or two. And so it's COVID-19 360. Keep watching. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. And uh, we're reading some comments after which we'll be speaking to Mary Coomson, who started a YouTube uh, page reading bedtime stories to children across uh, the UK. And so we'll find out more about that. But let's read some of your messages. Good morning, Bella. You look effortless. Thank you. I actually want to make a suggestion. I think all final year students across the length and breadth of the country need to be tested before heading to the classrooms. They can't be allowed to go back to school without knowing their fate on the virus. I think it's imperative that they subject themselves to testing before going back to school. This will go a long way to contain a possible spread. And the speediest of recoveries to Anita, this is Yusif in Mamobi. Very valid point, I must say. Hello, Bella. You're standing. Thank you. Anyways, I see sense in the ease of restrictions imposed on us. Um, as well. Well, his days are numbered. Okay, I guess you're talking about the president. Please, good morning. I want to find out if those writing of deck are also allowed to go for classes. This is from David Wedam. Well, we're expecting that the education ministry will break it down further for us at one of the press briefings or at any other point in time. And so uh, we're waiting for the details so that we'll know exactly what it is that can be done. Anyway, so, hello, Bella. Uh, you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. Please, is church service going to be first come, first serve, or what? Kiran Awilana inside Bulgar. That's what I was asking uh, Prophet Gilbert, but he says they are yet to come up with a plan. And so we'll wait patiently for the church to also brief us on their uh, structural changes as well. Hello, please. Good morning. I'm Delsa from Konongo. The reopening of schools, especially the senior high schools, are we all going to sleep in the dorm as it was before? And are we going to bath batch by batch? Okay. Uh, the crowd at the dining hall, day students going to school day in, day out because I am really scared. Well, good thing is that it's only the final year students that will be going to school. And so I don't think that you will experience as much crowding as uh, if the other levels were in school as well. But again, we're waiting for details from the ministry. Bella, I think this whole gradual lifting of the ban on social restrictions, most especially concerning religious gatherings, is a necessary evil. We just hope my Christian brothers and sisters do not abuse the opportunity Ghanaians cannot be trusted. Seyram from Ho. And good morning, Bella. You look beautiful. Thank you. Opening schools for the final year students is good. But my problem is, um, if it's not going to bring about any calamity, the right precautions should be taken effectively. Emmanuel and Dam from Dansoman. And hi, Bella. It is indeed a good move by the president to let our students return. But the big question is, how will the private teachers be paid? In my school, the final years are 14. So you can imagine how we'll be paid. Hmm. God help us. Oh, there are just 14 students in your school. Wow. Sarah from Asankragwa. Okay. Hello, Bella. Wishing Anita a speedy recovery. My question is, how are the students going to do when it comes to their psychological health? Or what measures are there for the psychologists to do uh, to help them? Because some are really nervous. This is from Ohems Kumasi. I believe that Dr. Newman touched on that uh, when we interacted with him. But crossing over to the other side. Now, you remember... 
when the lockdown happened across the world, especially um, in the U.S., we had Dolly Parton start her bedtime stories, and that caught fire almost immediately. A lot of children and a lot of parents also logged on to it. Now, we also have our own version of bedtime stories, and it's by Ghanaian. Her name is Araba. Uh, well, Mary Kumsen, pardon me, and she lives in the U.K. And so we're going to get to interact with her via Skype at this point. Hello. Good morning, Mary. Hi, good morning. Can you How are you me? doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Thank you very much. So story time with Mary. How and why did this start? So um, we've been in lockdown since the 13th of March. Well, personally, I've been at home since the 13th of March. Mm. I've got two very small children. So I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Okay. And I also work full time. So I've been trying to educate them at home, but while working at home as well. And it's been really tough. And I realized that this must be really difficult for other parents too. So I wanted to start something that could just support parents, much like myself, mm. with reading children a bedtime story. Okay. So that's basically how it started. How easy yes. has it been? And I want to find out if, first of all, you are a teacher. Maybe that's why it was easy to come up with this idea. Are you a teacher, first of all? I'm not, no. I, I actually work full-time for an asset management firm. So I actually work in digital marketing. So I'm not a teacher. So then this must be difficult experience. for you. It, it really is, yeah. So with these two young children at home, and they've been at home for 10 weeks, it's been really difficult. So I wanted to, you know, I read them a bedtime story every night. And I mm. thought, you know, how lovely would it be to do that for other parents? And okay, so you've been doing this for, what, since March? Since, yeah, since March, about four weeks now. You decided to add other children as well. How are you able to yes. gather those children and what's it like? Because your children may be t totally different from other children. And so whereas your children That's may right. want so to what... sit and listen to mommy read, some children <laughs> may not necessarily do that. So what have you been doing differently? Exactly. So it's actually recorded. So we have a YouTube channel. So our YouTube channel is Storytime with Mary. And then we also have a website, which is storytimewithmary.online, okay. where I'm recording these stories. So you can read it at your leisure. So it's not that, you know, the children have to gather around to watch a live recording. Oh, I see. You can read it at your leisure. Okay. Well, I thought it was live. So what are some of the books that you read to these children? And is it tailored to suit, um, you know, the UK education system? So it's, it's really just storybooks for okay. preschool children. So much like my own children, the early years children between the ages of two and up to five before they start formal education. And it helps them to be able to start recognizing some, um, some letters and some words and the sounds that those letters and words make. Um, a lot of research suggests that reading okay. to young children actually helps to improve their social skills, their communication skills, and also just to help with brain function as well. Okay, show us some of the books that you've been reading to these kids. Um, sure, so yeah, the first book that I started with was actually my daughter's favorite book. So my daughter absolutely loves Dougie. So okay. we have this book, Hey Dougie, Good Night Dougie, and we were reading it pretty much on repeat every single day for about three weeks. And I thought, how lovely would it be to read this to other two, three, four-year-olds? Mm. Because I know that my daughter absolutely loves it. Okay, open it up. Let's see what the, face, uh, the first page talks about i mean for parents yeah, who may sure. be interested so, i mean i can re i can read you the first page <laughs> okay can you at least just show us briefly before you read what it looks like Is yeah it... sure okay so a lot of illustrations okay okay yeah this should and be this interesting really helpful for young children yeah. i see what about the other books if i may ask yeah sure so i've got a book here called never touch the sharks and it's a it's a touchy feely book so the children can you know you can touch the the shark's teeth and the, its belly, and it, it helps children to count. So it helps mm. them to count up to five. Okay. But, but these kids are supposed to log online and, you know, watch your YouTube. So what's yes. the guarantee that they're paying attention? What's the guarantee they're not sleeping or getting busy with other things whilst <laughs> this is, so, um, you know, happening? Course, so what do you do so to the capture the them. attention? Exactly. So... Me, I'm very animated when I'm reading these books and I've always been very animated, especially with my own children. And also we're showing the books as well. So we're showing the pages, the colors. It's very, very engaging. And we've had some really, really good feedback. 
from hmm. little children, well, via their parents, of course, about how much they're enjoying story time with Mary. Okay. So since you're saying you're very animated, we want to see how animated you can be whilst reading. So let's just say, because children also watch the show. So let's just say that sure. you're reading to these children. What would it be like? Okay, so I'm going to read you the first page of Hey Dougie, okay. just to give you a feel of what we've been doing. So, it's a very noisy day at the clubhouse. Bang, bang, boing, boing, spin, spin, boom, boom, vroom. Dougie thinks it's time for a glass of milk. So that's the first page. I see. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's actually very interesting. Do you have your kids also trying to, uh, you know, repeat some of the things that you do? Oh, definitely. So yeah. I, have, I have a two-year-old who is going to be three in July. And she's been developing, but we were a bit worried about her speaking. Since she's been at home and we've been reading a lot to her, yeah, she's having conversations with us and it's amazing. I can imagine. Now in the UK, yeah. maybe the internet connectivity is top notch. Uh, maybe it's affordable. But here in Ghana, we're dealing with people who might have lost their jobs, already having to grapple with online tuition for their children. Now they also have to add on extra costs to log on to YouTube and listen to story time with Mary. That may be a difficulty. So as a parent, what advice would you give to other parents who are also looking for ways to get their children to, you know, get engrossed in their storybooks and read, whether by the parents themselves or the children? Of course, I think, um, you know, reading, um, like I said earlier, is very, very important, especially at this young age that we're targeting, because this is how they get to understand how the words look, what they sound like, you know, looking at the pictures to associate them with those words. It's so, so, so important. So reading to your children just once a day, you know, a bedtime story, it mm. really helps. And, you know, I appreciate obviously the internet connection may be, you know, not the same as it is in the UK. However, what we've done here is we've tried to support the teachers. So we know that, you know, in Ghana, we've been in lockdown since the 16th of March. And I know that schools are slowly, you know, starting back up at the, mid at the middle of June. However, we can't, you know, the teachers have done a great job and we, we're so grateful to what the teachers do for our children. Mm. And just since being at home, I completely lay my hat down to the teachers and I, I really appreciate what they do. But we need to support them with that. So any little bit that we can do in supporting them to educate our children is really helpful. Okay. Do you provide some training for parents as well on the side? just in case they also want to be as animated or find fun ways to read? <laughs> I haven't, but that's a really great idea. <laughs> okay, so, well, you owe me for that idea. So I once do. I start seeing that you're raking in uh, the exactly. money, then I'm going to come and charge you. But Mary Kumsin, it's been a pleasure um, reading with you, maybe, and even talking to you about story time with Mary. And we wish Fantastic. you the best. And how do people Thanks. log in if they also want to be a part of story time with Mary? Yeah, sure. So we have a YouTube channel, which if you go on YouTube and you just type in Storytime with Mary, I should come up. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. We also have a website, which is storytimewithmary.online. So Storytime with Mary is one word and then dot online. And um, I just want, had one last thing to say, Bella. You know, thank you so much for this. And, you know, the, the one challenge that we do have is that we don't have endless amounts of books. We don't have endless books. So if there are any authors of books that are watching this, we would really, really appreciate it if you wanted to partner with us to go ahead and read your books. All right. Thank you so much, Mary, um, and all the best. And so we've been speaking to Mary Kumsin, who starts a story time with Mary. I don't know how applicable this is in our setting, but parents, let us know what you think via social media. Maybe you should start reading to your kids as well. Gather the few in your community. Make sure they have their nose mask and are adhering to the social distancing directive, or maybe just the children in your home, and read to them. It's important. We'll be back with more. More than 6.15 million cases of coronavirus have been confirmed around the world according to the data from John Hopkins University. Nearly 372,000 people have died. Almost one third of these deaths have been recorded in the United States. At least 2.64 million have recovered globally. But that is not stopping the world from attempting a return to normal like Ghana. Countries across the globe are easing slowly to normalcy. Metro Manila, Philippines capital home of 12 million people have been in lockdown since mid-March but starting today more people will be allowed to work and shops will reopen. 
But restaurants will not be dined in and bars, cinemas and other spaces will still close. Residents of Moscow will be allowed to go out for a walk for the first time in more than two months beginning today. The United Kingdom is also preparing to relax its lockdown despite concerns among the government's scientific advisory body. Eating out back on menu in Turkey as lockdown is eased further, restaurants, cafes, museums, beaches and swimming pools are due to reopen. More than 4,500 people have died from the virus, but authorities say the outbreak is now under control. Hong Kong announces first locally transmitted cases in two weeks. The new cases bring the total number of cases in the territory to 1,085 with four deaths. Brazil reported 480 deaths from coronavirus on Sunday, bringing its death toll to 29,314. More than half a million people in the country have now been confirmed to have COVID-19. Stadium seats 10,000 soccer fans all on Zoom. With no fans in the stadium, AGF Ahos and Randers played in front of a digital audience when Denmark's top flight Superliga resumed on Thursday following a gap of more than two weeks. And that's all for COVID-19 360 News around the globe. All right, and that was our update in terms of news around the globe. It will be coming your way every day on COVID-19 360. But let's quickly cross over to the African continent and find out what our numbers look like. Now, as it stands now, we have confirmed 147,397 cases across the African continent. And um, this is basically um, what it looks like. Let me just, you know, open it up for you. And so um, South Africa at the moment, um, still as high as 32,683. Now South Africa and Egypt have been going um, head to head in terms of the number of infections across um, Africa. And so Egypt also has a high number at the moment. They stand at 24,985. Now let's look at Nigeria. Also pretty high with 10,162, with Algeria coming in with 9,394. Then Ghana also comes in with 8,070. And so this is how high the numbers are. Let's look at Morocco also at 7,819. Cameroon and Sudan in 6,143 and 5,026 respectively. So if you look closely, these are the countries that have the most uh, confirmed cases on the African continent. But again, every African country has recorded a case as well, with some as low as two cases. Lesotho having the lowest number of cases at the moment, with Seychelles coming in second but last with 11 cases. And so let's cross over and find out how many health workers have also been infected as well. And Nigeria tops the list at this moment, even though uh, South Africa is the number one country with the most confirmed cases. Nigeria has the country with the most confirmed cases amongst health workers with 606 of them. Unfortunately, two of them, um, I believe, have lost their lives. And then in South Africa, 511 of them have contracted the virus with 14 losing their lives. Now, Egypt comes in third with 350 health workers contracting the virus. 19 of them uh, have recorded deaths. And Cameroon comes in fourth with 181 uh, health workers, three dead. Niger, 177 cases, no death. In Ghana, currently 126 health workers have uh, been tested positive uh, for COVID-19. Tunisia and Cote d'Ivoire come in um, in the other places as well. So Tunisia with 116 and Cote d'Ivoire with 116 as well. Let's go to the end. And as it stands now, about five countries have recorded just one um, healthcare workers positive uh, who have tested positive. So Angola, Burundi, Mali, Guinea, and Tanzania. And so now let's move on to the number uh, that have lost their lives as a result of COVID-19 across the continent. Egypt still tops with 959, very close to 1,000 people losing their lives in Egypt. South Africa comes in second with 683. Algeria with 653. Nigeria also following closely with 287. Sudan, 286. And Morocco, 
285. Now, as much as Ghana is part of the top six African countries on the continent with the most cases, Ghana still has recorded very low uh, cases when it comes to death. As you all know, we currently have recorded 36 cases. And so we're just behind Senegal with 42 cases as well. And overall, 4,228 Africans um, have moved on or passed uh, as a result of COVID-19. And in terms of recovery, 62,000 Africans um, have recovered. So 62,222. South Africa has the highest uh, number of recoveries, 16,809. Egypt, 6,037. Morocco with 5,754. Algeria with uh, 5,748. Then we have Cameroon and Nigeria and Ghana also following closely with 3,578, 3,007 and 2,947 respectively. Going to the lower part, so uh, Lesotho still at the bottom with just one recovery. And those are the numbers for the African continent as well and so now let's just go back to your comments and find out what you're also saying so this one says that good morning bella um i wish anita a speedy recovery this is ramsey east Legon school has been reopened and the borders are closed what happens to the foreigners schooling in ghana hmm. very valid question uh so these final year students who are foreigners what happens to them and hello bella and chairman anita i love this program a lot thank you but as for me you are my mentor from Grachi inside United States of Inkoko. Okay, not sure who this is going for, but thank you. Uh, if it's for me, thank you. If it's Anita, thank you on her behalf. And um, I think the president shouldn't have opened schools because it might affect the students in a way that they would not follow the safety precautions. Okay, my question is what about churches with small spaces and large congregations? What are we doing about that? That's Kelvin inside Jasikan. We're waiting for the, the churches to come up with a plan, uh, but let's keep our fingers crossed. I'm sure they'll come up with ways to handle the situation. Hello, Bella. I uh, wish I need a speedy recovery. My question, how are the students going to, what are they going to do when it comes to their psychological health or what are the measures uh, for psychologists? Okay, so basically how are we going to manage them psychologically, especially because most of them are nervous. This is Ohims from Kumase. Anyway, so that's about it for today. I believe that we've touched on everything that we intended to touch on. But tomorrow we'll be back with some more information. It's COVID-19 360. We hope to gather some students as well so they can tell us what